Our first question will come from Steve Jewin. Thank you, Tim. First, I want to say congratulations on your last fight with Tyrell Fortune. Very dominant win. You put him out in the first round, and he was highly touted as an up-and-coming prospect going into that fight. So do you see this as like a rebirth of your career? Um, yeah, probably. Uh, you know, a lot of people wrote me off. Um, <laughs> a lot of people did uh, going into that fight, and it kind of put a little chip on my shoulder as in, um, seems like everyone forgot the type of people I fought in the UFC. Um, the two guys I fought when I came to Bellator and just cause I got, you know, lost in horrific fashion to them, um, seemed to think that maybe I was on my way out. Um, and I just didn't want to be a step, like, a just, I did not want to be a stepping stone. And, um, and, and you know, the back of my back, I was against the wall. You know, if I lost that fight, uh, I probably would have been back on the regional level. And if I was back on the regional level, I think it'd probably been. I would have considered you know, it was probably time to go back and start my you know career after fighting and uh, probably would have been done. So I uh, definitely put a put a fire under my rear and yeah, um, you know, got a great outcome and got another chance to kind of uh, hopefully work my way up the ladder. Well, Matt Mitrion would be a huge step up the ladder if you're able to get the W over him. So how do you see that fight going in your head? Um, in my head, in the perfect world, um, you know, it would be, you know, get, get into a grind situation, get on the fence, uh, find a good opening for a takedown and kind of get, in a, uh, you know, doing something Bader did, wasn't able to do, uh, get a finish uh, with a TKO. That would be exciting. We'd look forward to that. But what about the fact that Matt Mitrione holds career wins over people like Fedor Emelianenko? Does that play into the back of your head at all? Uh, no, not really. Um, you know, he... He's got some great wins. Uh, I consider some of my wins some good wins, um, and yeah, it's he's he's got uh, he's definitely got talent in his hands and his athletic ability to you know to take out pretty much anybody. Uh, but you know, same thing. There's uh, he's definitely got holes in his game like I do, and hopefully I can exploit them. Well, with career wins over the likes of Marcin Tybora and Shamil Abdurakhimov, I don't think anybody can doubt you. So have a great performance on Friday. We look forward to seeing it. All right. Thank you. Our next question comes from Steven Morocco. Your line is live. Hey, Tim. Um, when you said you were close to considering uh, starting your other career, what 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 is that career? Um, it's when I it's actually still I, I do it. To this day, um, every every fall and harvest, I go back to uh, Minnesota and I, I spread dry fertilizer. I work for a, a, a cooperative um, in an agronomy uh, agronomy plant. Um, it's what I went to school for uh, to be an agronomist, and then I went to school again to be constri- uh, and got my degree in criminal justice. But my heart my heart's in the Midwest, the fields of the the corn the corn fields of the Midwest is where I love to be, and um, uh, so I get a lot of a lot of working hours doing that. Does that does that provide a good living? It does. Um, it's, it's all about hours for that. Um, during the winter, you really don't do much, but during the, during the fall and summer, they get a lot of hours. Uh, I think last fall, uh, I was averaging, you know, a hundred hour work weeks. Wow. Yeah. Um, what is, do, do you have like a, you know, one year, five year plan, uh, at this point in your career, uh, your MMA career? Um, yeah, probably like a th- more like a three year, three year plan. Um, it's, you know, I'm, I'm 35. Um, people seem to think I'm like 40 or something. <laughs> and, uh, and that's why I got, maybe I was clean shaven and remind people I'm not as old as I, as I always appear. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely things, you know, a three year, I think three years left on the career. If I can make it to 38, that'd be a pretty solid goal. Um, get, you know, anywhere between eight to 12 fights left in me, um, and see where everything ends up. But, you know, it's definitely getting to the point where I'm starting to think about life beyond fighting and fighting's means to the end. Even though I love to compete, I've um, been a competitor my whole life, it's, it's definitely in, in the three-year plan. Do you think about that, uh, a rematch with Czech Congo uh, often now that you guys are, you know, sharing the same, you know, he's the one that sort of introduced you to the promotion and he's, uh, he's obviously within reach? Uh, yes, that's, uh, you know, things... If things go well, um, go my way uh, for uh, against, against Matt, you know, I think that'd be, uh, I'd love the opportunity to do that again. Um, you know, uh, there's, you know, I think there's a fight card in September. I'd love to do a quick turnaround and 
you know, get another fight in and win or win or lose. Um, but that would be a great, I think that'd be a good fight to, you know, kind of, kind of show myself, kind of prove to myself kind of that I've still, still got it and get it. Uh, and, you know, win against check would put you, put you right back in line for uh, maybe a title contention. Do you think that Bader's going to be able to hold on to the heavyweight title this year? Um, I'm not sure what Bader's going to do. Um, I hope he, I hope he chooses here pretty quick what weight class is going to go because it's kind of putting a, it's putting a, you know, a traffic jam in the light heavyweight and heavyweight. So uh, hopefully here pretty soon that we're going to find out if he's going to go keep light heavyweight or go heavyweight and kind of open up either either one of the weight classes so it can get him moving again. Thank you, Tim. Our next question comes from Andrew McCarroll. Hi, Tim. Hope you're well. Um, I noticed on your Instagram, um, amongst other things I wish I hadn't seen, um, that you're training <laughs> with uh, Roy Nelson and Francis Ngannou. Um, where do you measure yourself against guys like that when you're training with them day in and day out? Um, I measure myself with uh, when, I'm on my, when I'm on my game, um, I can compete with anybody. Uh, and it shows in the practice room. Um, and in, any athlete who's honest with himself knows that in, some days are off, some days are on, but you're on days. So that's where you know where you're actually at. And what I said um, after my win against Tyrell got brought up, um, something like that. And I was like, I'm hanging with these guys just fine in the practice room, but I just sometimes it just doesn't come out on fight day. Uh, you know, uh, but you can lay it the way you can word it however you want. Just sometimes, uh, the, the, the fighter that I am, that I know I am, doesn't always show up. And it's just a battle within yourself to make sure that that's the, that's the one who shows up here on Friday. Fighters are always talking about the, you know, the, it's like going to war. It's like going to war. As someone who is actually a combat veteran yourself, are those two experiences actually comparable in any way? Or is there anything you can take from your experience as a combat veteran that you can bring into the cage? Um, yeah, it's, uh, fighting's easy compared to, you know, driving down the roads of Iraq, <laughs> um, <laughs> it, but there is, there is some comparability to it as in, uh, when you're on the, when you, when you're on the, you know, the lines ready to, ready to drive out, um, ready to, you know, been, get your mission going, you got anxiety, you got some anxiety, you got some adrenaline. Um, but once you get on the road and start driving, everything calms down and you get back to normal. And so that's very comparable to a fight. Uh, you're on the walkout, the first couple, you know, 30 seconds of a fight, you're high, you're all high, you're tense, you're trying to, you know, calm yourself down. Um, eventually, kind of stuff just rolls in and your training kicks in. It's, it, you fall back on your training, just like, in, I guess, in the military sense. And finally, probably the most important question, will we see the mustache again? Uh, maybe in the future. Uh, we'll, we're going to be seeing here. Um, I actually might be here in the fall here, uh, probably be rejoining the military again. Um, it was always in my long-term plans to do it. And I think, uh, I took about a four year hiatus and now, you know, uh, got a, got a, got a little girl on the way. So, um, thinking, thinking about the future stuff now. And, and so I can't grow a beard anymore in the military. So <laughs> the only facial hair I'd be able to grow is a mustache. So, uh, yeah, you, you'll probably be seeing it here again. <laughs> That's Louis Jeff. My pleasure to speak to you, Tim. Congratulations yeah, on, you. Uh, on the new arrival as well. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Next question comes from Ben Keeley. Hi, Tim. Uh, congrats again on the new arrival. And uh, you, you also you got married this year as well, so congrats on that. Yep, thank you, thank you. Uh, how does it feel to be a married man? Uh, you know, it's, uh, life doesn't change too much, except you say yes, dear, a little bit, with <laughs> a little more effort. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, yeah, you, men you mentioned earlier that you trained with France and Ganu. For someone who's never experienced his punching power, how can you describe it? Can you put that into words? <laughs> it's like getting hit with a truck. Uh, he's, he's dropped me with a couple of body shot liver shots a handful of times. That's uh, and he's rattled my head, rattled the brain around a little bit. He hits hard. And the thing is, even when he's not trying to hit you hard, he hits hard. So it's just, it's just one of those natural things that you can't really teach. You just, you have it. Like you, I can't throw a hundred miles an hour fastball, no matter how much you teach me. It's kind of the same thing with him. Uh, it's, it's just natural. Um, do you, you, do you still bounce at, at strip clubs? Uh, no, I do not now. <laughs> no, ever since I moved out of Fargo, uh, no, no, no more working than there. Uh, my only job is coming back, uh, coming back to the Midwest, uh, for spring and fall for planting season and harvest and get, get about 
three weeks of work in each fall and harvest, then go back to Vegas. Uh, just what during your bouncing days, did ever get? Do you remember any particularly rowdy uh, get uh, clientele, or do you remember like any times where it got a bit ropey? I guess with uh, has it ever gotten dangerous? I suppose is what I'm trying to ask. Oh yeah, at the club, yeah. There's been uh, there's been a couple a uh, couple knives pulled. Uh, we had a, a couple of handgun violations. We had a guy actually got mad because he didn't want to. He was on our ban list because he caused troubles and walked out the door and popped a couple shots off at the club. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, little old Fargo does sometimes I would say have his bad apples, but yeah, uh, overall it, it was pretty, uh, pretty calm, but about once a week, there'd be someone who didn't, who would get, get their beer muscles on and would want to fight somebody. <laughs> Well, that sounds almost as dangerous as sparring with Francis and Ganu. Um, <laughs> uh, did you develop any new hobbies during the coronavirus lockdown? Uh, yeah, building, gaining a gut. <laughs> uh, <laughs> don't get a lot of you don't get a lot of exercise when you're driving around in tractors. I can tell you that. Uh, the when the corona, but like when uh, the shutdown happened in March, I went back. I went back to Minnesota and started working right away. So I was working from middle of March till just probably July first, and that's when I got. Hey, you're probably going to be fighting in here in August. So you probably should get back and uh, start working, working out. I'm like, yeah, sounds good. I probably need to anyways. <laughs> All right. Fantastic team. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you. Our last questions will come from Kevin Vardis. Hey, Tim, Kevin from Overtime Heroics. How you doing? Not uh, doing good. All right, so, you know, Ryan Bader is actually defending his light heavyweight championship in the next pay-per-view in Bellator 244. So who do you think, if there had to be a number one contender's fight, would be fighting for the heavyweight championship? If there had to be a number one contender's fight? Uh, Minikoff. Jeez. That's, I mean, that's probably no joke. I wouldn't, even though Czech beat him, I'm still putting Minikoff as the number one contender. So how far do you see yourself from title contention at the moment? How many fights do you think you need to win to get a shot at Ryan Bader possibly? Um, you know, probably two solid wins uh, could possibly do it, but maybe three. Um, you know, uh, it depends on the opponents. And, you know, a win against Matt um, would be would put me in the driver's seat to maybe possibly get a rematch with, you know, a check, um, which uh, – you know, hopefully that one, if you get a two wins like that, then you could possibly be in the title contention considering that um, uh, Czech and uh, Vitaly both fought to get there in that, in that uh, title. So um, yeah, somewhere around there, I would say. All right. So you fought Vitaly almost on like 12 hours notice per se. Like eight. Like eight. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, obviously not a lot of time for for game planning, you know, you just had to so, go in there, fight on the blow, fight on just, you know, your wit. Um, from watching that first fight, do you know how you can beat him? Or uh, was he actually like, you know, you experienced the game plan he had and it's like a pretty tough game plan? Um, you don't fight you don't fight a guy in his level on eight hours notice. I, I figured that out the hard way. <laughs> um, you no, know, it's just it it will be a my it would be a good mindset thing. Like I when I if we fight again, um, what's the worst that can happen? The worst that, that could happen already happened. So I don't need to worry about that. <laughs> I can just concentrate on you know trying to implement a implement a good game plan um, with a little more time and um, yeah try to try to not get tossed around like a rag doll. <laughs> All right, last question is. You emphasize that against Matt Mitrione, you plan on using your wrestling. So, um, you know, are, are you going to go in looking for the takedown? Or are you going to, you know, uh, get your gauge your distance and see where he's uh, where his weak point is and take him down? Um, yeah, I'm not going to rush wrestling. I'm not going to push wrestling. Um, there's one thing. Uh, I don't mind losses in, in fighting or in anything as long as you learn something from them. And I my Czech Congo fight, I definitely learned something. Um, you know, uh, I wasn't feeling comfortable on my feet the first handful, you know, 20 seconds in or whatever. And I rushed in for a takedown that wasn't there. I tried pushing something that wasn't there and, you know, it didn't end up in, it ended up being the demise of me. Um, and I'm not going to make that mistake twice. Um, yeah, I don't want people over rest or, uh, to really take my wrestling when I said I was, I plan on wrestling. That's not, it's not, I'm going to go push wrestling, wrestling. I'm going to stand in front of them and wait for an opening. 
Um, I don't care. I mean, I might have to take a couple, couple punches of the head with a little bit of a licking to find it, but I'm not going to push anything that's not there. All right. And uh, we're wishing you good luck from the Overtime Heroics group. All right. Good luck. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tim.